Um, we're really pleased to have Tanta showing here this month. Uh, Tanta did her Diploma of Fine Arts at Visa. She has exhibited at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, at Victoria Airport, and the Victoria Conference Centre, um, at the 2011 Florence Biennale, and is artist in residence at the Oswego mm -hmm. Hotel. Well. So, a pretty extensive exhibition record, and lucky that she's uh, able to speak about her work today. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And well, thanks everybody for coming. That's lovely. Um, of course, at 3 in the morning, I knew exactly what I was going to say. And then when I would wake up, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I will certainly answer questions on how this is done. But I think that you need a little bit of a background because it's been a long evolution to get to this point. And so I thought, well, so I thought, okay, well, I'll look in the dictionary. And so what I found in the dictionary was abstract art is to depart from the known to the concrete. It does not attempt to represent eternal, um, external reality, but rather seeks to achieve its effects by using shape, color, and textures. Abstract art may exist with a degree of independence from the visual references of the known world. So this certainly is an example of that. And then imagination. Because, and I'm going to tell you a story of imagination after this. And the definition of imagination was, it is the ability to imagine things that aren't real. The ability to picture in your mind something that you have not seen or experienced before. The imagination gives you the ability to think of new ideas and extraordinary things. So, I was fortunate enough. I had a very odd childhood on a farm in a remote area and from some older eccentric parents. And they just expected me to leave after breakfast and arrive home for dinner. And whatever I did with my day in between was my own. And so being on this farm, I kind of had carte blanche with the tool shed and the workshop. So I could go and build all kinds of things and it didn't matter whether they worked or not because the only people that were looking at them and the only creatures that were looking at them were cows, you know, and they were very non, you know, judgmental. <laughs> and, you know, if I made a boat or something that sunk right away or tipped over or a kite out of two by ones that was never going to fly, it didn't make any difference. Going home, as I would sort of go along a dirt road, all of the sort of wildflowers and the grasses, as I was going home, would turn into fairies and sprites and things that I could have a conversation with, you know. And then, you know, I would come across massive puddles in dirt roads, and of course those were always my segues to another world, whether it was either what was being reflected from above, because the sun would come up, or those wonderful holes that just brought straight, straight down. So life goes on, and you know, I moved to a bigger city, uh, became married, parent, working in many, many different kinds of jobs. And I kind of, not that I ever lost my imagination, but I sort of lost the whimsy. And then fortunately, I came across Vancouver Island School of Art and started taking classes. And, and that was sort of kind of a cracking open. But I'm not a very good representative of painter. Like if I had to paint something, it really looked like something that's never going to happen. And eventually, for the final year, I used to school for the diploma program, and I'm not too sure how it happened, but I ended up doing installations. And I ended up using massive long cords, 20-foot long cords, white electrical cords. I had about 50 of them, along with pieces of wire, plexiglass that had been thrown out of retail places because they were scratched, weird little boxes. Um, wire and things, and I spent 10 months making and remaking these objects, I think about six times. And they either would go to the ceiling and come down into a point, or they would roll along a corner. And eventually, for the grad show, they kind of went through a hallway and then sort of oozed in through another room and up onto the ceiling. And through doing that, and it, it was really physical work, and I was always on ladders, and I was always really afraid one, of stabbing somebody, or the thing would fall apart into somebody, so it was really secure, then I would have to undo it. So, so I, I was getting kind of fed up and being obligated to all of this stuff. 
And I had a hard time finding it, so of course I never let it go either. And somebody suggested that why don't I do some small paintings? And so that is how the small white ones started. Because I could pick up this little one. So, so a similarity of all of this work is everything is started on an 8 by 10 inch frame, canvas frame. And so I just sort of would cut through it and I would start working. And so these were like mini installations. They're kind of like a small dog that's behaving badly. You could pick it up. I could put it under my arm. I could put it on my knees. <laughs> I could bicycle home with these. You know, I could put a whole bunch of them into a Rubbermaid container. And, but, I mean, it's not necessarily what you wish for, but you never know what's going to happen. And, and at first, it was a really free relationship between these paintings and myself. But eventually, I mean, you sort of cross over, right? And eventually it became very emotional. And um, I, and, and then I realized that each one was an emotion. And so what I put into it, you know, was far more than what I expected. And, and of course, and then there were the layers and layers of paint to conceal them. Um, and when I named the paintings, I, by then I was starting to do haikus. So that is why each one has a corresponding haiku. But to me, the, the haiku is as important as the piece because it, it explains, and I understand that it's very difficult for people to look at an abstract object and see it as an emotion. But if you take the time and look at it, um, there are these, because we are all these creatures, and even though I'm this particular shape, I'm not really, you know, you have all these layers that are hidden or transparent or around you and they change and shift uh, properly throughout the day or certainly throughout a year or throughout your lifetime. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about the work or talks on that sort of philosophy of the fact that, uh, and as so many people here are artists, but the fact that you put you cannot help but put your imprint, your skin, your ideas, all your thoughts into a piece of work. Uh, and, and if you try to separate yourself from it, then it's not a good piece of work. And you're not satisfied with it. But it does come at a cost. So when I hung the show, it was the first time I saw them all out and I was really pleased, but I thought that the paintings <coughs> all looked nervous. They looked vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I almost took them all down. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of thought, no, you can't do that, you can't. This is the process, this is the whole idea. But I sort of thought, I don't know if I necessarily want them to be out here because they were so vulnerable. You know, and I didn't want anybody to be mean to them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right. Do the paintings always come before the haiku? Yeah, so I go, and actually, we all finish a painting first. So one whole painting will be finished. And I dip them in batches because I have a very small studio and I'm terrified of, you know, um, you know I don't want black splashed onto the white stuff so they're dipped or I have a different process and, and, and actually um, some of them I lay in it's almost like a baby's plastic bath and I with my hand I tried with rubber gloves but that was hopeless I will just I I pour with my hands the paint over over them um, and so some of them have certainly some of the medium gray ones have maybe 20 layers of paint on them they have a substantial weight to them once they're finished. Uh, but each painting is finished, and then I sort of sat there and, and thought about the emotion that the painting um, sent back to me, and then I would name the painting and then write the haiku. Yeah, yeah I can really see the creativity in it, and I was wondering, the objects, are they just things that you've saved over the years, like from past, or do you sample items, or just where do you get all the... Well, I think some of it is, it, is that the same way from yeah. being on a farm yeah. and, you know, being able to use wires and yeah. washers and stuff. And place. Um, I worked in retail for many years, so a lot of it is weird stuff from retail. Just, um, ah, I remember spending one entire day taking plastic tablecloths off of hangers that had been sent from China, folding them all up, wrapping them with wrapping so they would look more interesting. And I thought, oh my god, there's somebody in China who spent their whole day putting these on the hangers so that they would come out somewhere. So this sort of crazy detail. So, so there are things like cut up coat hangers in there, zap straps, 
um, just all sorts of stuff. And I'm not too sure how the lace started, but it just seemed to work that lace. <coughs> so I just considered them all to be like drawings, that the wires are drawn, line, the lace is a drawn shape. Mm -hmm. um, I was just looking at the vibrant colors of your scarf, and I was wondering why you've chosen whites and grays and black. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not sure because they all started out white. And it could have been that the installation work that I was working with was just white, grays, and blacks and, and mirror surfaces. Uh, I honestly can't imagine them in a color. Mm -hmm. And yet I do paint paintings yeah. with lots of color. Mm -hmm. When you're starting a piece, uh, how are you choosing the elements that are going into that one? Like, are you saying, oh, this lace is saying something to me, this piece of art, and then you build it up that way and it's on much more. But what's the starting point? Just so, getting to the point. So the starting point is, is one um, canvas, 8 by 10 canvas. And then I'll usually just cut it with an exacto knife, which is an extremely wonderful feeling. <laughs> canvas, truly great. And then I will just start to work. So I might have, and I will have around me like string or wires or delays, my handy dandy drill, you know, and this assortment of screws and washers and plastic things. And it's just, and then it's just building. And that part is, is much like doing the installation. And sometimes, well, no, probably not. But if something doesn't look quite right, then I'll just add more. So, can this your process always added? Do you, do you ever subtract elements? Well, for so this work, I would say no, it's always added. Uh, the frames have been cut out, isn't it? Yeah, so, this, so some of the canvas has been cut away. Not, but in some, some I'll just slash it or some I'll fold it back, but like the exposed one, the canvas was really folded back and tied. Um, and that whole idea also that things should be secure. Everything is put on very well. Yeah. Are these custom made canvases? No, so these are, these are just um, inexpensive buzz canvases mm -hmm. which are um, are, are particularly good canvases. So this is actually a really great way of, of using them. And I, I figured that because everything is so texturally different that, that, that it had to have something that was consistent. And so that's the canvas. And also it was the fact that you can pick it up and move it small. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tanta, I'm just wondering how you know when you're finished. And if it is the emotion that comes out at that point, it tells you when you're done. I, I think so. I think that all of a sudden it is finished, um, which it, for me is a very difficult thing. Certainly on paintings, you know, I have some of the paintings that I've overpainted so many times that you can hardly lift them up. Um, or, it's, or I see a painting somewhere and it's I could, you know, finish it off, but but uh, these ones, at some time, they are just finished, yeah. And I think, and it, it is emotional, and it certainly is. I mean, some are much happier than others, which is obviously what happens um, during your span of doing a, a series. I just want like to come back to what I just said with regard to the color or the lack thereof. For me, it's just perfect the way it is because it does, there is no additional color that deters me from already all the information that's there. You know, like, otherwise, it would give it another layer of emotion that might not be the one that I see. I might look at one of your paintings and I find it rather soothing. If you chose in red, I would find it you know, maybe just too much to handle. So for me, I agree with you. I couldn't imagine the color. Maybe another series, but this is very clever. Yeah, thank you. And it was interesting because for a long time, I only had white ones. So then to go into the sort of this kind of pottery slip color and then into the grays and then the blacks, it was just like, oh, you know, I, they just, it was just like, oh no, oh no, what have I done? But, but I really like them and I think that as a series that they really work well together. Yeah. Did you find some emotions more difficult than others? I certainly found writing some of the haikus more difficult. You know, I mean, it's one. It's, I mean, some of them are kind of humorous, but the ones that are really, um, you know, where you kind of, you know, torn out a chunk of yourself and throw it up there are certainly difficult. Or to admit, um, like some of some of the paintings are, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily failures, but but the the, um, the emotion isn't necessarily a happy emotion, right? It, it is one of so. 
I think in the art world, you try to always be as positive as possible because there are so many things that are going to trip you up along the way regardless. Or you, or you only want to expose so much because it is out in the public. Um, so the haikus uh, are really extremely honest. Um, somehow or other you can't, you know, if I sort of, if I wrote one, I sort of, that's a little too close to the bone. I couldn't change it back, or if I did change it back, it just didn't work. It was like, just do it. Yeah. Very courageous, I think. Especially some of those, the, the, the emotions that we don't want to look at. Like, yeah, really, yeah. really beautiful things. How did the larger piece of all? So the larger piece, <coughs> The large, the large piece is the odd. And it's actually the tray that everything drips into. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, so it's a, it's a big tray, and I have um, kind of a, um, I think it actually originally hold letter, hold reading cards. So I have clips that I can put on so these paintings can drip and dry because it takes weeks and weeks for them to dry. And so originally I thought, oh, you know, I'll put some wire down there and I'll put some lace down there and then I'll pull it off. And then I can use that because in parts here I have, like here, I've cut out just pure paint that has dried mm -hmm. from all the drips and cut it and reassembled it in there. Well, I couldn't get it out. Mm -hmm. I, you know, didn't matter what I had, like a sledgehammer. And then I had, like, I don't know, some sort of scrawny things that I found in the shed. It stayed there, and, and then the more and more, and then of course in my studio floor I had paper, the paper laid up, and of course the paint would sort of ooze over, and then eventually I kind of ripped it all up. And, and then I looked and I thought, you know, actually that is, a, that is the beginning. Even though it was sort of the end where everything dripped off, that was the beginning, so that has a part of each one of these paintings, and each piece that was used in it, in there. Yeah. It's a real dialogue with your material. Thanks, Shirley. Yeah, it is a dialogue. And of course, being practical, right? I mean, it was just killing me that all this paint was being wasted. And once I realized, especially for the sun of them, these, I have this whole system in my studio now. And, and, you know, I can rip it up out of certain rubber made containers, certain things that won't ever come out of, like whatever that surface was. Um, but you can just sort of cut it up and use it again. Handy drill. <laughs> So, any other questions? What happened to the large installation, the materials from the large installation? Oh, I have them in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's why your space is so small. <laughs> the studio actually was a bachelor apartment um, that we rented out, I think, for about a couple of months and actually got paid for it, and then children stayed in there while they went to university, right, because it was an outside door, right? So, so as soon as the last one, as soon as Vanessa left, the stove went, the fridge went, the locks got changed, you know, so she's just like, that was quick, you know, all, all her stuff was slapped out, and so it has like a bathroom and a shower, so in the shower, I have rubber made containers, you know, saying wire, white plastic coat hangers, <laughs> um, widgets, uh, plexiglass, and they're stacked up to the ceiling, and then sort of every conceivable corner or under every trestle table is the stuff that I was smart enough to label it all. So I can, yeah. so every once in a while I need, you know, a 20 foot length of white electrical wire, and there it is at the bottom of the shower. <laughs> Did you incorporate any of those materials into these pieces, or are these all, this is all new? These found materials. These would pop, have some of the pieces, but smaller. Mm -hmm. Just like smaller, or the wire, certainly the wire that I have. It's this, has some of that in it, but, but it's been cut into pieces. Or the big pieces of, like, not, not necessarily chicken wire, but um, whatever the other kind of wires that you have for different, so more like a grid type wire. Like a, hard, cut hard, up, hard like a hardware cloth, yeah, mm -hmm. was cut up and put in. And, and of course, one of my favorite, um, not instruments, um, uh, pieces to use is that stuff that plumbers use, right? Plumbing. Plumbing tape wire, you know, to hold. Um, well, like multiple holes. Yeah, that's right. Because oh, it looks just like lace. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it has that scalloped edge. Because it has a scalloped edge, and that's what they use, what, I guess, for 
hot water tanks. Yeah, maybe a pipe to yeah. hold pipes and things. Yeah. I'm really curious about all of the lace and the uh, crochet. So did you have all of that in your household, or did you acquire it somehow? No, I acquired it. I have a really I love the look of lace, and especially beautiful lace, and people who have lace on their clothes, mm -hmm. but it truly creeps me out. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, and I would go to people's houses that had doilies, and then the mm -hmm. lace that went across the yeah. you know, Chesterfields and stuff, it was like I couldn't breathe, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was like, you know, Victorian. Very, that's right, and, and all the stuff that went with it. Mm -hmm. um, and but, so I'm not exactly sure how the lace started to become incorporated in here. Mm -hmm. I think it was just also one of those things that, and, and then just looking at it purely as a shape. But as you sort of get to the black um, little sculptures, uh, to me they've very, become very mask-like and they're sort of medieval and uh, they're not particularly nice looking. They're, they're quite intense and scary. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly to do maybe with that lace and be concealed. But it also seems like the nice contrast between it being feminine and domestic mm -hmm. and then maybe the masculine of the hardware yeah. things. And I think that's sort of the possibleness of, 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 you know, um, embroidering washers yeah. into fine lace, mm -hmm. you know, and then taking the plumber's mm -hmm. metal yeah. stuff and using that. I think that, that certainly intrigues me. And I think that and certainly in the installation, it was this, this whole mixture of nothing that should belong together. Mm -hmm. and, and then also stuff that I can physically move. You know, I mean, there's no point in me getting a, uh, a gauge of wire that I can't bend with um, snips or something because, you know, it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like the lace because there's also the transfer of someone else's. Art, yeah. or what they would have put a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. into. And I have to say that place Juliana gave me a lot of this lace, and it was so beautiful, mm -hmm. and it was out of linen, and I apologized to it. I did. I sat in the studio and I said, "I'm so sorry." <laughs> you know, before I cut it up and, and dipped it to this paint, and I still felt kind of badly at first because I knew that somebody had spent a really long time, and it was very special, but. Um, mm -hmm. It got dipped in paint anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I really love the, the contrast of the lace mm -hmm. and the hard, you know, the hard wire. And it's what I really like about it in connection to emotion. It's like another way of seeing things because there are crevices that you can look through, there are new insights, and, and it's like you've almost given it new life. Mm -hmm. And I really like yeah. that. Yeah. I like that concept. Yeah. I also love the shadows that it creates. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Like, and the work does look lovely in this gallery because there are beautiful lighting and the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, throughout the day, um, they, they move. Yes, you yeah. know, they, yeah. they kind of breathe a little bit and move yeah. along the wall. When you started with this project, <coughs> were you conceiving that you'd have maybe 30 odd paintings starting from light to very, very light to very dark? No, I, I started and I worked, so this, this has taken about three years to complete. And I have about nine other white ones that, have, that are dispersed around the world. Um, and so I was only ever going to do white. And I, I cannot remember why I, I know that it wasn't a mismixed paint. <laughs> um, but I, how, why I decided to do it, and it could have been just because I was doing it for so long. And I really enjoy making these, so I will certainly make more, mm -hmm. um, just because they're, um, it's, it's not that they're easy, but, but it's almost like, you say, if you're an embroiderer, and you can pick up a small piece of something, and you can just work on it for a while, or a small drawing, um, I think maybe I'm so familiar with them now, that it's, it's a pleasure to do them. Mm -hmm. I think that was a brilliant idea of the gradation because it's, you know, that shades of emotion. Yes, that's right, because it's not all white. And, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Not all black and white. And how about black and white? That's right, not all black and white. Yeah. To me, they're just Google Earth images of places you've been to that you've been happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Old St. Paul, <laughs> the Sage Concert Hall in Glasgow. Uh, definitely the flying buttresses from Sharp or from um, 
Dr. Dong. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's. These, it's these lovely represent that all places that you probably have had wonderful experiences in, because mm -hmm. that's what they look like. They're Google Earth uh -huh. satellite images. Uh -huh. so, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Tanta, because I know you're drawing. These are quite different in a way. I mean, they're, they're similar and yet they're different because of this. Because there's so much overlap, and there's, there's areas that are completely occluded, and you know there's something underneath. And that is true in the drawing, but these seem different. So it, 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 can you talk a little bit about how these might compare? With your, if you were to go back and forth drawing from Facebook, at least inspired by these pieces, would it change from the way that you were approaching the drawing? Now? I think how, how, I, I would say that these pieces, and working physically with the installation work, which is 3D, has taught me sort of how to turn a two-dimensional object drawing into a three-dimensional object, which is my goal. Um, it is much harder, and of course it is very difficult to do, and this is much easier, but certainly from working with this, I now have this sort of tactile intelligence that does come through, not all the time, but does come through sometimes. Um, certainly this work has improved all the work that I've done. Um, but I now realize, having worked you know, for, for like the last five years or so um, as an artist, that everything that I do informs the next piece that's going to happen. And, you, and I can't discard any of them. And series, for all of you, series are a fantastic thing to do. Because you never know what's going to happen. And you have to just do, you just have to work through it. Yeah. <laughs> the Florence exhibition was all white, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So and three of went. these went to the uh, Florence Biennale, and they were white. And um, could you start in gray yet? No. So that that took about another eighteen months. And the ones that were in Florence, I I could have prepared better. I didn't have anything written in Italian, and of course my, my Italian was non-existent. And um, so people would look, and, and and people were very intrigued because they would they were they couldn't quite figure out these industrial items. In these paintings, they were something very different from what else was there. But they would see my name and they would see the Canadian flag, and so they all would sort of go, oh, Snow! <laughs> <laughs> so the first time I went, Snow? I said, It's not snow, they're recycled items. And I couldn't find the word in Italian for recycle because they don't really recycle. So recycle means garbage. And so, you know, that wasn't the anymore. <laughs> it's not snow. So after, you know, a couple of days, I went, Snow? <laughs> so there you have to really prepare. It was my own fault, that one. Yeah, because that's what I'm thinking. They have no idea that it never snows where I live. Uh, or very rarely. So that's kind of um, the story of all these little things. <coughs>